Welcome to the Oh So Spurs podcast, where today we are bathing in a victory and a much needed victory. <laughs> we'll be discussing our four goals against Newcastle, the player reviews. Is Kulisewski now playing in his best role? That Romero red card and new contracts coming out the door at Tottenham. So, boys, I think um, we've got to start with the win, don't we? Um, Johnny and I are at the ground. Deej, you, you've got a good view of it on TV. Do you want to tell us about it from your perspective, Deej, to start with? I mean, obviously, um, there was a... I, I think it was right after the third goal, or right before the third goal. Um, but, man... When when that ground gets going, it sounds incredible. Even on TV, I can't imagine what it must have been like to to be in the ground. But I thought that it was just it was just a comprehensive victory. We had a couple of chances that we gave away because of playing a high line and some miscommunication. Um, obviously, the one chance where Davies played it off of Isak's shin when it was coming across the goal is the one that stands out. I think that's that was their best chance of the game besides the one that they scored. Um, but other than that, I thought we we played really strong defensively. I thought we did a lot better um, attacking, like continuing our attack instead of stalling at the at the eighteen, like we did against West Ham, and then passing it around a bit. I think that the big difference today, there were a lot of differences in the game. Having Sar back and his ability to more comprehensively like switch positions with Poro, allowing Poro to underlap more, as he can do that a lot better. And I think Hoybier can. And I think we saw the um, the benefits of that in the build-up. I think Kulisevsky plays really, really well on that inside uh, role as a 10. We'll talk about that a bit more later, I'm sure. And I think that while I still think Sun's best position is centrally, I also think he's better than anything else we have on the wing at this point, which I mean, I guess makes sense. He's He's a quite good player. Can't really get a whole lot better. But I mean... He he's not the best one v one player, but going up against Trippier, that doesn't really matter. Sorry, Trippier. No, he did absolutely skin Trippier alive. It's given all of us Spurs fans that reminder because we were saying like, oh, you know, can't believe we ever sold the guy. What a player he is! Crazy, and then it's come flooding back to now remembering under Poch when those those high balls were going over the top of him and he was getting skinned alive in the Champions League at the end. And I'm starting to remember why why we did. Try to move on from him, even though the subsequent signings didn't work out. That's not a debate completely. Johnny, um, what did you make of the performance, starting with, the, as Deej touched on there, it was a different formation to, to West Ham with some tweaks to the lineup. Saar was back in there. What were the main differences for you that, that helped us with such an improved performance? It was just, it, it was funny because the it, I felt the atmosphere at the beginning was quite edgy um, and when we weren't getting the second goal or took long enough to get the first goal, it seemed at the time. And I, I, I felt like um, even though the players were playing playing really, really, really um, well as usual in, at the beginning of the game. But I guess the, the obvious thing is that you've got Johnson on the right where he's supposed to play and Sun's back in a position that he spent most of his career at. And Richarlison's also in his preferred position. So it kind of like seems really obvious. I, I guess Ange hasn't really had the luxury to, to do that though, because with Richardson's uh, operation and then before that, I suppose there was uh, issues about him finding the back of the net, whether or not what happened uh, yesterday is going to be the kind of new dawn that we pray it might be in terms of Richardson. Now he's got his confidence. Um, there was an interesting piece I read. There was an interview with him about his, views looking back to the surgery issue whether he would or whether he wouldn't and he was kind of like I mean it's very obvious from listening to, to to quotes that he's just desperate for it to work and he's he's really wants to make it work at Spurs but he's obviously got his massive motivation to to do um, what he wants to do for Brazil as well so that's always played into his his decision um in terms of um yeah going ahead and getting that surgery but he was saying like that it sounds now as if he's really able to to play without any kind of pain and the difference that has made to him maybe psychologically even more than than uh, physically is massive and like like obviously that's the the uh the optimist in me is certainly hoping that clearly um strikers drive on goals and I think Richarlison is possibly a player who's maybe even more vulnerable, maybe to going in a bit of a run without goals. 
Um, but like he he was really really good yesterday, and uh, I mean I can understand why I just took him off because if it's only Friday when we're playing again, and there's no point when we're we're in, we're in such a comfortable position to keep him on the pitch any longer. But I I think for me that's the although he wasn't necessarily the best player, he was certainly one of the best players to have. Goals come in from Richarlison is absolutely huge, and as DJ said, like, and as DJ was saying actually the other night for the preview, you know, to to look at, you know, the benefit of having the options of Kulusevski playing in different positions, of Johnson playing in different positions, and then kind of, um, I think it was Sai earlier on in the in the group was talking about, you know, c- could it be that we could accommodate, um, could accommodate Ms. Madison and Kulusevski. As the as the more attacking midfield options and and having maybe Basuma in behind or something or Benton in behind, you know this there is now starting to look when when we do get the players back, it's really really exciting. And I was quite surprised, and we were both really happy with the lineup before the game, Jim. But like, I I was still quite surprised, and I love the way that Ange kind of when you see it and you think about, it, think oh yeah, that, that that's kind of that makes sense. Um, but he doesn't necessarily do what's really predictable unless he's got everybody fit like he did at the beginning of the year. So yeah. No. Those those buzzers. Yeah. It was definitely, as you said, Richarlison's best performance in a Spurs shirt, I'd say, mm, overall. Definitely. Um and yeah. it, it, it's just shell fickle we are as fans, isn't it? It's like this guy has been playing on an injury all this time. Yeah. But we just have no room for forgiveness because we're just so desperate for those results yeah. that yeah. we just have no patience for these people as humans because we're not, we don't have time to wait for you to be okay. We need things to be okay for us yeah. right now. And you're you're stopping that. You're getting in the way of it. Now go get your surgery or get out my club. You know, it's kind of that. It, it's ridiculous. And he's always had a great work ethic as a footballer. I don't think we can ever deny that. But I, I had noticed a behaviour change today where it was like, what I didn't like when we first signed him, it was this kind of, a bit being a bit overly zealous is that the word when he when he scored a bit kind of like a bit too showboaty I, was, I didn't really like that over sense of confidence but now he just feels like I mean he looks like a man in the zone who's just like right scored need to go get another one straight back mm-hmm. um, so yeah it, it was a great performance um, and uh, before we move on to the next part of the show we should talk about the Italians on behalf of Stu, Stu shouldn't we Deej what do you make of Udobi and Vicario in that game I mean I think Vicario obviously my man of the match for doing nothing but making that one face at Callum Wilson <laughs> um, then having Callum Wilson kick off about respect in the post-match presser which is just delightfully ironic I mean, I'm sure every podcast in the world that covers Tottenham or Tottenham adjacent things will talk about that. So we don't need to talk about it too much. But it's just, hmm, karma's a dish best served, piping hot. Um, <laughs> and then the other, the other, um, our other Italian, Yudogi, who just recently signed a new contract, shout out. Um, <laughs> what was it? Till 2029 with yeah, an extra year? What an amazing I think it's two extra years, and- isn't it? Two extra years? Yeah, wow. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't read the, right, the details, yeah. but nothing ever goes wrong for players signing deals that long at Tottenham. So <laughs> <laughs> glad we did that while we could. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think he, he showed, in my opinion, why I think we need to prioritize a 1v1 winger. Because him being able to be that underlapping fullback um, is so much more effective when he is able to do it while on the ball side. Because when Sun was there and Sun had Trippier on toast over and over and over again, I don't want to keep picking on Trippier, but I mean, it's just what happened. When you know that the player that's defending Sun is going to get beat, you end up with a center back or potentially like a defensive midfielder also having their eyes drawn to the ball because they know they're going to need to step in when Sun makes it past the first man. And so then that combined with Yudogi being there as as someone who like isn't necessarily like, supposed to be there in like a normal football tactic, more or less, uh, allows for him to be in spaces like he was today for his first goal, where he is just wide open, basically, in the at the edge of the six, which doesn't happen when you're not on the ball side because the players on that side don't have to think about, oh, well, what happens if the ball gets past this man? And like that question... And the creation of those cutbacks that Sun made for two of the goals today 
are exactly why I think that that kind of player is so important because we just that that kind of goal creation threat from an overload is just so 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 overwhelming at times for teams that aren't set up to deal with it perfectly and even then you you put the ball in the mixer sometimes it just I mean think about our Liverpool game Matt Tip sometimes you just score a screamer into your own top ends um Mm -hmm. I think that uh so yeah I think you Dogi. excellent game excellent contract yeah very good. And an Italian kiss at the end. No, I agree with that, that especially that end comment, right? It's the, the way we play. If you imagine um, danger zones on a football pitch, the, the box is always going to be a red zone. It doesn't matter if you've got 11 defenders in there from one team, uh, 10 defenders from one team, and just a random rogue ball in there. There's still a chance they could hit it in their own net. And just, just you're going to always be in with a shot of a goal if you're getting the ball onto that area. And we continuously just fill that zone with problems and that's that's Angie's view it doesn't matter if you're a center back or a striker get in there of their space and try get a ball to that individual there if you've got it um johnny yeah, I mean, did you have anything yeah have no i just i guess is um i guess i don't mean to be um self-deprecating or anything like d <laughs> d just really good at, um really articulating the nuances I, I think just more more as just somebody who's who's there privileged enough to be there and just like be immersed in an experience where you are just watching a team which is largely made up of the same individuals that you were watching the previous year and you were watching this absolutely sensational football. And it was like the number of times I know it was very much facilitated by uh the fact that Newcastle tried to go forward as well and that they've obviously they're quite fatigued and so on but i think that aside i think it doesn't matter like the the um efficacy of tottenham's advanced play and the the numbers that are getting forward just was wave after wave after wave of um spurs breaking and like supporting and the the support that they were getting from all over the pitch and the numbers that were in the box. I mean, do you remember last year, like how few touches we had in the opponent's box in entire matches? It was like literally single figures of touches. It was outrageous. And I just think that to be, uh, I'm really so pleased that we got the result. We got um, annoying to have lost the goal there at the end. I actually missed that goal because we were in a bit of a rush to get to the train. But um, yeah, like, we we were really due a win like that because we we have been saying for the last number of weeks that we've been you know we've been dominating games. I I I'm really pleased that it vindicates and maybe silences a little bit of critics and people who who might like we were saying the, the three of us on Friday the um, with Stu and Deej myself that um, the loss lack of perspective and I I I don't get it like everybody everybody is entitled to their opinion but there's some. So really, even on Sunday Sunday afternoon before the game, that's, I just don't understand what people are saying. Like about how how poor we are. Like, cause we're not. We've been playing bloody brilliant football. I'm sorry. I know that we haven't been putting pulling the trigger, or, and we haven't been um, we haven't been scoring as many goals, and we we've not got the we've not got the, the um, scores on the board to to reflect the dominance. And yeah, it's all about getting the ball in the net. And West Ham got their two goals, however they got them. But I think it's this has been coming, and it's it's really exciting when you think of the players that are out, and we're still able to play like that yesterday. It's like so mm-hmm. good. I'm so I'm so excited. And now, like, isn't it crazy? How I don't know about you guys, but when you when you get a win like that, and it's against one of the other top teams, although yeah, Newcastle weren't great yesterday. But then you start to look at the table again and think, well, Villa are in a place where we should be. And like you look at the games, and I know we don't want to be dwelling too much on what you know, what ifs and all that, because not everyone can do that. But there's there's so much to play for. Like there's we're only just over you know a third of the season down. There's a lot to play for, and I I'm excited again about. Well, I wasn't really yeah. not excited, but I'm really I'm ho- I'm more hopeful again. Um, yeah. Let's let's. Well, I, I th- yeah. Oh God, sorry. I didn't mean to cut across you there. No, John. no, I was just Can thinking I... about. I, I know. We'll, I'm sure there'll be another pod ahead of Forest, but you can't look at when you've been on a poor run of games in terms of results, and then 
and you've got Newcastle and things like that, then even Forest away is starting to look a bit ropey and, and you can't count any chickens and I'm certainly would you know uh, and Arsenal lost their last season or, or the year before but we've we've you know I'd be if we put anything close to that against Forest we should wipe the floor with them you know quite comfortably yeah so uh, that that Friday kickoff is a blessing and a curse because if you mm. win it you go into oh, yeah. that weekend of no pressure just yeah. watching everyone else playing someone's going to drop a point somewhere yeah. and you just you can enjoy every minute of your weekend without football absorbing yeah. it as we're all obviously absorbed enough into football to do this and and that <laughs> is, it's enough to ruin your weekend every weekend if it doesn't go your way that bloody chicken yeah. owns my life um yeah. but uh yeah it's it's also a debate this in the way back with my uncle as well got me into spurs you know he's he's an older gentleman now who's seen it all and as he always says it's it's kind of weird this year because we're going to go into that february onwards period suddenly as a much stronger team potentially mm. whereas mm. the top typical top four or five teams that is when things get really tough you're mm. competing on three or four fronts injuries are racking up you're losing players you're prioritizing trophies whereas we're going to be one game a week and suddenly potentially going oh my god how do we give this guy game time like we've got too many players on the bench so it could be mm. a second half of the season where we're just hunting them down and going yeah dare we dream a little bit um <laughs> <laughs> but do, do you want to get the one quick negative discussion out of the way from that game just just like one minute Let's on go. each Let's just just it. one minute on each and that was the romero's tackle that has divided opinion so you everyone gets one minute on this. We're not going to waste too much time because it's a negative topic after a great win. But Deez, you can start. You got is it a red, yellow, or orange, or nothing? What I do mean, you make of it? it's an orange card, which means it's a yellow card, in my opinion. It was a it was a rash tackle. I don't think it was necessarily malicious. I am not. If he had to leave one in on anyone, I'm glad it was Callum Wilson. If I'm being completely honest, as he wasn't injured or anything, so I don't feel bad about saying that. Um, it was a rash tackle. I wish he wouldn't make those, especially given the circumstances of the of the game. But that's kind of how he plays. He's a he's a front foot defender. Some of the best defenders of all time are front foot defenders, and got sent off way more than Romero does has. Um, like if if you were to tell us like six years ago, like hey, you want prime Sergio Ramos, you're not going to say no. He gets sent off an insane amount of times. And he's still considered one of the best center backs in history. So I think that I think the problem is exacerbated by our lack of depth. I think that once we have that option of not playing a wing back in his place when he is not there, I think that we'll be able to quote unquote roll with the punches a little more. Um I also think that the the opinion is kind of driven by commentary a bit because I and some, from what I've heard from some other places, didn't think the tackle was that close to a red based on U.S. commentary of the game. They said it was an orange card, but it almost certainly wasn't deserving of a red. Um, but it sounds like it was different on. Uh, it sounds like it was different in in the U.K. So I think that that's interesting uh, based on how I think that the the perception of the tackle was different in my eyes and other people. Who, most of which who I talked about were in the UK. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much my piece. <laughs> Yanni, what about you? Red, yellow, orange, neither? I, I'm going to be, uh, I think it was a yellow as well. I, 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 I didn't really see it to get a very clear view from where I was in the ground, and I didn't really see it until this evening. Um, obviously heard a lot by the reaction, but I mean, when you read the quotes and you hear the people who are kind of given out about how reckless it was and how like how much of a psychopath he is or, or how kind of indisciplined he is then it's not a surprise you know like it's always the same same guy saying those things like teachers right the media has got an agenda over here sorry and um yeah it's it's a pity though because i guess it means he's in the in the um firing line or he's in the he's in the kind of limelight again and you just hope that that doesn't play in the minds of referees or something he's, he's obviously got a reputation and um 
it's not going to probably help him, you know, in, in future situations, mm. which is a pity because we had had been saying kind of in, in the first half of October, even when we think more or less got to the end of September, hadn't even committed a foul. <laughs> and then suddenly the yellows start to pop along. Um, but like DJ was saying, the one against West Ham was, was that wasn't a yellow. So like there are some, there are some in there that are not, you know, not legit. And yeah, that's, I don't know. I don't really have anything more to say. It, 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 to me, it looked, didn't look like uh, it didn't look like a red. All right, one more thing. One more thing. I just want to say one more thing. Um, we are not having this discussion about how unbelievably rash he is. If you didn't get that yellow against West Ham, we are, but it's not nearly the the magnitude that we're having it now. I think that mm. the we're letting the most recent absolute yellow. I'm not going to try and say it wasn't yellow. It was a foul. It was a bad foul. It wasn't a red, but it was a bad mm. foul. This conversation is had as severely as it is if he doesn't get that absolutely insane yellow against West Ham, mm. because then his his disciplinary record is much better. Because mm. you don't have that many times to mess up. This, this is the thing yeah. about I think you both touched there. It's like um, it's that there, there is uh, what you would call what's the word an unconscious bias. So I forget the right terminology for this particular case where he has a reputation and therefore mm. he's more likely to get booked or sent off if he puts himself in a what you call a fifty fifty. 40 60 situation but johnny isn't it like when you have that you have a kid at school and you say look you're on your last warning your last warning and you're or you're getting suspended and then you you look up and you just see him like throwing a chair out the window and you're like why are you doing that like it's, I, you, that's not even that bad a thing to do but why <laughs> just you're on a war just why are you such a oh, i'm trying to help you i'm trying think, yeah <laughs> think throwing a I think yeah. throwing a chair out the window is definitely a red card offense. If I had to guess, uh, you're it depends uh, what school you uh, went to. But I, I think Alan um, Pardew spoke about it a bit. Was it um, who's the player that passed away? The midfield at TOT um, for that he had. Was it was it him that was there a midfielder who passed away? Right. Used to play for him um, oh. at Newcastle. Okay, I'm Sounds sure. Right, wow. I'm, sh- I'm I'm sure that. It was TOT, wasn't it? Oh, Czech um, sure. TOT, yeah, Czech TOT. Yeah, Czech TOT, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He died, gosh, nearly six years yeah. ago now. Um, wow. But he spoke about him and he was saying he was exactly the same. It's like, look, we've got massive, massive game on Saturday. Please just stay on the pitch. And he just go flying in and put a marker on the man and first minute and be suspended. But mm. brilliant player. You, you can't tell adults how to be you are who you are and sometimes people like to play on the edge of risk and by people play at the edge of being safe and Romero will always like to play with a, his heart and his sleeve and, and play at a bit of a risk so we've got to just like Dee said he's going to be our Sergio Ramos type he's got to learn to live with it even though it annoys the hell out of me it just is what it there, is there is <laughs> there is a sort of happy medium though isn't there I mean like I think the ones we were talking about yesterday yesterday yeah like Dee just saying definitely is worthy of a conversation and the orange is about right but the the one against West Ham was clearly a good tackle and um so so in fairness to Romero like those aren't really the sorts of ones that are are a problem from from my point of view it's it's like when he does when he's made tackles in the past the Milan one is one that immediately comes to mind um and you think, mate, what are you doing? You are actually one of our most senior players, and now you're the vice captain. Like, for he does have a responsibility, and I do think that having Son as a captain, it's actually, uh, and yesterday was a perfect example of that. Where actually, it's more than just a sort of an armband and uh, a title, and you know, shaking, tossing coins and stuff like that. You know, uh, if it if, when you've got Son in that role, like he is really leading by example on and off the pitch with his words, with his play and the way that he reacts to the match situation as well and get and it gets involved with the crowd i'm really loving the way this season like the players are really interacting and encouraging the crowd and um it's like it's so it's so much better like you there's a real connection there and uh yeah i think that sun is a huge part of that even though like uh, at um the arsenal game like after the after his goal the equal the equalizer like Absolutely fantastic, you know, and I think Romero needs to bring that back a little bit sometimes and, and try to just not not do the stupid stuff, you know. There's very, all, very, all very well to be 
kind of have the Ramos edge and have that aggression, of course, it is what makes him a brilliant player. But you do need to have control, you know, and a bit of game perspective too. Yeah, I, I agree. It's um, it's just we let our frustrations out of fans because we know de- we know deep down that if he miss if he misses another game. Hmm. That game is more likely than not going to end in defeat, and therefore we're lashing out at him because just, just, just don't. Anyway, and it's not going mm. to. It's a negative. We've had a great win, and actually, Royale did all right in that position. But um, yeah, I was going to say we had, we had games with uh, we had games where Emerson Royale and Ben Davies were our center yeah, backs, yeah. and we lost two one. And then we had our first game back with Romero, and we lost two one. So maybe it doesn't actually make mm. that big of a difference. Well, oh, yeah, and credit to Davies, by the way. <laughs> I know he, yeah. everyone flip-flops between the guy, but my word, like, for He's... someone who's who's was signed as a left-back to be chucked into these kind of games and these kind of positions and to yeah. put in shifts like that and never, ever whinge about the club and the media... Um, to Like, his, his contract, I don't think, is very big for a Premier League footballer playing for a club like Spurs either. It's like, it's, I think it was like 40 grand a week wow. when I looked it up, which... You know, yeah. he never kicks up a fuss. He could yeah. probably quite easily have gone mm. not not to a top top club, but he could have probably forced to move somewhere else mm. and got slightly better for himself. So he is yeah. well, the had, perfect squad player. We had yeah. Romero and um, we had sorry, we had Royal and uh, Davies with City, didn't we? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Didn't lose that one. Didn't no. did ship three though. I had a City though. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I. Want to before we stop talking about the game, I want to talk about two more players that I feel like I haven't talked about enough. I talked about a little bit, but the difference that Saar makes in our midfield just cannot mm. go understated. Oh, yeah. Correct. Correct. He yeah. might not be the type of player that has the flashiest of plays. He did have that one where mm. he just absolutely deleted Anthony Gordon, which was mm. loved that one. Um but there, he might not have the flashiest of highlight reels, but man, he just, he eats up space. He, like I mentioned earlier, he's able to play with Poro so much better mm-hmm. than anyone else in our midfield can. And he just, I think he honestly, he makes our midfield tick as much as everyone else in that midfield. Um, and then also, uh, I don't know if we want to talk about Sar a little bit more, but I also want to bring yeah. up how absolutely incredible Pedro Poro has been this season. I was not oh, his fan, yeah. biggest fan going into the season because I thought that his defensive acumen was lacking. Mm. I have been proven wrong. Mm. I don't know if it was a tactical thing or what, but man, he just looks like a completely different player. Yeah, and the fair play to the guy because he's often with these players. Talk about Romero just as an example. Like you can't coach certain things out of certain people or into certain people once they seem to get to their like you know mid twenties in football. But Poro has taken on this new role under Ange and 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 gone from strength to strength. Like you say, his defensive games improved. And on Saar, just yeah, and on contracts. I know we've mentioned it before the pod, but for those listening, he's got two and a half years left on his contract. So I'm starting to get a little bit sweaty about that. I'm hoping, and I think we will this season, see a, a, a contract offer extended to him to lock him down for five years. It would be very nice. Um, but Johnny, yeah, did you want to comment on Sars' performance at all? He, he seemed pretty think, pivotal to that improved. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, was, he was fantastic. And I, th- I think as well, especially for such a young player, he is so composed. And I think our our game completely relies on players trusting themselves and backing themselves and playing with like playing quick early passes with purpose and um he was he was superb because obviously like that's something that Hoiberg just isn't really able to do particularly effectively um and you now Sar- Sarah's in a different level especially considering how young he is and it, it's interesting you said there about the contract because I was reading after um the Adoki contract news and he was again so have have spoken about this before but i think genuinely the Ange uh, factor is not to be understated when it comes to the the him being a, a reason that players want to, to be at Spurs. and there's some it, 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 he was talking really glowingly about Ange when he was talking about the new contract and just saying about the impact that Ange has made on him as a player and the impact that he, right from the very beginning in the summer, the, the, the effect that he had, the impact he had on him, and the, tr- the trust he's, he's felt from him. It's, I don't know. I mean, 
sure we can all see it when we see what's happening on the pitch but i think that the more you know players coming out and saying things like that it just gives you again a little bit more hope i know it's not just about that but you, you, we had the conversation last week about the top four and champions league football and all the rest of it but i do think the managers really kind of oh, be yeah. start making an impact a, a, around the world of football because i'm I don't know what the story is outside of England or the UK, but um, surely, but the the coverage of the Premier League, like, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what each thinks from the US point of view. Like, is there a lot more noise around Spurs this year now because of the way that we're playing football? Is is that I'm wondering? Is that something? To think the sort of thing that would be happening in other countries as well. <laughs> I think it is mostly because uh, uh, because of the way that I mean I guess globalization works. A lot of the a lot of like the talk around football in general is still very much spearheaded by the by like British media, and then mm. it's kind of picked up and twisted a little okay. bit, and then repackaged more or less by English media. Because I mean, let's be real: most people are getting their news from Twitter, and Twitter isn't necessarily geo locked. So I might not be watching like talk sport every day, but I still get talk sport clips on my on my Twitter feed far, far too much um, <laughs> for the content that they produce. Um, but yeah, I think that I I mean, I think that the, the atmosphere around the club and the fans in general is just so, so much better than it was last year uh, in, in the UK mm. here. And I'm, I'm sure in the rest of the world as well, it's just, Anjbal oh. is oh, bellissimo. I actually yeah. had a uh, email today from a from a client, and I was thinking, oh, maybe it's something to do with work. You know, nice nice new order for James. Um, but it was uh, no, it was we might be signing Lucas Mora at Orlando FC. So uh, <laughs> has this guy got any any juice left in the tank? <laughs> I yes. said, watch the Champions League semi final. Here's the YouTube clip. Drink it in. <laughs> Because um, mm. you'll you'll have twenty frustrating appearances, and then you'll get one like that, and you'll you'll uh, you might quite like the guy. Um, and he'll always he'll always put a shift in, won't he, Lucas? He always worked hard. Yeah. Um, Watch his final touch for Tottenham against Leeds, <laughs> and nothing else. Don't don't go back to the games before those. <laughs> we don't talk about those anymore. No, we don't. No, we don't. Um, and did we mention Fraser Forster's contract on the on the episode? I no, don't I think so. It's yeah. a, it's just a. Good piece of business. I mean, yeah. he's he's a he's a decent backup. I hope he's not in for any penalties, but uh, <laughs> he's <laughs> he's a he's a solid backup. He's homegrown. Can't really ask for much more. Yeah, right, right yeah. age range. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Good being business. a backup goalkeeper is the in the Premier League must be the best retirement job on the planet. Like, you're still probably getting twenty grand a week, and you might have to do your job a couple of days a year. Yeah. Quite if nice. you're Ramsdale, you get way more. Yeah. And every rubbish, everyone expected you to be. So there you go. Um, then uh, should we just quickly go on to some score predictions for um, our next game against Forest? Uh, depends oh. on if we're doing a yeah. A, are we doing a preview? Are we, are we doing a preview? Yeah, we're we gonna save those for the preview. Yeah, yeah. We probably will do a preview actually, but I think we should. We should... won. We should talk about it twice. <laughs> so I want to talk about Tottenham for. <laughs> if we had lost, there would not have been a preview, probably. <laughs> that is very any... true. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's save it for the preview. But have we got any more players coming back for next week? We're still waiting I... for that January start date, aren't we, for everyone to start yeah, flooding back? Like I think some everyone dates, comes hopefully. back January, February, and then the sun leaves. Well, there was some other thing. Go on, sorry. Well, sorry, no, just like, it's, it's surely Sessignon's got at some point, he's got to be near. <laughs> yes. Like, he just seems to be Sessignon's always a couple start... of weeks. Date of 2025 now. <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> let's see. When is he back according to the physio rooms, the, the default? Uh, okay. Physio room, Premier League. By the way, while that's coming up, can we talk about the whinging? Um, two things. Arsenal fans have resorted to this weird conspiracy theory that the Premier League is trying to prevent them from winning anything. And there's mm. compilations that some... Um, children have put together on Twitter that are every decision they've had this season hyper-analyzed and justified. It's every single one they've had, like 50-50s. Right. It's just gone, this whole thing around this season, and now Newcastle are doing the same against us. We did it with Villa. It feels like there's, I don't know what it is this season, but there's just this mad 
rushed to reanalyze decisions which have been analyzed on VAR and then yeah. dispute it and look at it from every angle and then argue why it could be one or the other. I find it incredibly. It's really, really annoying and it's a really bad thing. And I think that this is, I think that it's kind of showing the shortcoming of VAR that decisions aren't necessarily mm. objective. They're mm. subjective. And as much as you want to mm -hmm. bring objectivity into the game, VAR is just going to make it, you able to make a better call, but it's still at the end of the day, I mean, I was looking at the rules for a red card because of, you know, all the Romero stuff. And it's like three sentences. It's like, if it endangers the opponent, that's basically it. It's like a few yeah. paragraphs of a couple sentences each. It's not mm. all that much. Um, and I, it's at the end of the day, you can make a better subjective call, but at the end of the day, it is still a subjective call. And you're obviously going to have people disagreeing with those calls, especially with your supporters' glasses on. Like, yeah. there are tackles that, Romero was made that have probably been worse than we think they are. Well, mm. I mean, Romero is probably the one exception to that for us. <laughs> um, but there have been tackles that other players have made on our players that we probably think are worse than they are because we look at it yeah. through a lens of everyone else is bad and we're good. And how dare the, the bad guys do something bad to the good guys and not get punished for it to the highest extent of the law, which is just absolutely mm -hmm. not the way to look at the game and why mm -hmm. i think that's that's i think the main thing that we need to be looking to fix with with VAR is how we handle decisions like those yeah i agree I think, it's the god sorry johnny no no it's, it's like i i've i was really for years i was thinking why have we not got video um technology assisting referees and then when it was coming in i was like really really pleased and i was you know, obviously, we kind of benefited in some big games early on, the, the Champions League being the obvious example. And I mean, how like the Lorente one is still, I don't know how the hell we got away with that, but you know, off his leg, man. <laughs> but I, I honestly think now, because especially when, when I'm a the, the length of time it's taking to make the decisions, and then b like when you're in the stadium. The number of times there's been goals I've not celebrated because I was convinced somebody's offside, and then, like, on some cases I've been wrong, and I'm thinking like I was totally robbed of that moment of you know ecstasy. Um, I think like fair enough for for offsides because you can kind of draw the lines. I know this kind of sometimes gets to stupid, you know, margins. But at least you can sort of argue that there's almost a, a degree of objectivity there, and probably the, the well the same thing for obviously the goal line technology. Like that's a bit of a no brainer. But out from that, I don't know if there's any like I I would be I very agree. happy for everything else to be scrapped. You know, I... semi automated offsides is yeah. more than enough for me. Plus, yeah. VAR to be there if someone is not on camera trying to gouge someone's eye out on purpose. Yes, yeah, so that's off. fair like, enough. That's like yeah. levels of extreme. Mm. Should not be like, mm, is it? Or oh, that's all yeah, 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 discussion yeah. upstairs. Yeah. yeah. I think that this is one thing that American sports do really well. I was watching a football manager uh, streamer, uh, Zealand. Um, not that I, I don't know. I just don't want to think, claim that I came up with this idea because I didn't. But I think it's a good one. And I think it bears repeating that. I think that this is one thing American sports do really well in terms of video refereeing is their referees are allowed to get stuff wrong, but coaches are allowed a finite number of yeah. challenges. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that is something that would allow for the pace mm. of the game to be somewhat restored because I mean, just thinking back to some of our other games, we've had like, we, I mean, at the beginning of the season, there were like 10 minutes being added onto games because of bar decisions taking like eight minutes to look at. So true. Yeah, and it's just it just ruins the pace of the game. But, totally. There's also like I think an element of if you had two two reviews in the game, a manager can't then go back and say, "Oh, there was that incident in the 20th minute." Because they'd be like, "Well, why didn't you dispute it then?" Because at yeah, the time yeah. you were saying yeah. that wasn't a big one, and you thought a bigger one would come along. So it kind of like gets rid of that whole. Yeah, I think that's a good shout, and it would make it fun having like two reviews in a game, and you know, then suddenly. If you've saved yours to the 95th minute, they go, you know it's going to be used at the end. Yes, exactly. So you're kind of like, fuck, they're going to use it against the goal we just scored. We can't celebrate just yet. And there's always that kind of like, yeah, I think that it could add a bit of fun. Yeah, and, it, yeah. Works, it works really well in cricket as well. Like if you, yeah. there was the, one of the best ones was the, 
the the Headingley Test match where Ben Stokes did his insane, uh, insane century that won the game against Australia, and the, it was so close to the end, and Australia were like really bricking it, and they made this most ridiculous review. I know this is supposed to be a football podcast, but they made this most ridiculous review for an LBW, and it was not even close to being an LBW, and then and that meant that all the reviews were gone, and then there was a genuine. A, 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 a kind of was, was Jesus, Jesus right face just like, cricket and his face just gone like, like no, but every American he's just right. signed off Deeds brought this up <laughs> <laughs> but no, it were it's it is but it is entertaining. And you got the whole countdown, like whatever it's fifteen seconds I think the captain has yeah. to decide and you know and it's it's good. Um and you yeah. know where you're standing, you know it's only gonna be fifteen seconds, we can live with that. Um so I think that's a really I think that's a brilliant idea actually. Yeah. yeah we could I fun. try to watch cricket, I promise. I <laughs> Oh, I love it. It's love just it. like a, it's just like baseball with, with history. And I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's a very much it's a marmite sport. I love it personally, but let's oh. not get it. Let's not get too, too into that. I just want to quickly finish off on the injury updates because um, we've got to end in a minute. But it looks like we've got Benton Kerr, Van der Ven, Madison, Sessegnon, Solomon, and Dyer all returning in January. Dyer might be sooner, um, but yeah, suddenly. The 30th of January, though, for uh, Mickey van der Ven, by the sounds of it. So that'd be a bit later. Mm. But Ange's last comments imply he still thinks he will be back before Feb. So, yeah, good five key players coming oh, back going in that second half. would just be, just be yeah. brilliant. Hopefully. It's very nice that they are coming back into... They will be coming back during our sort of January break. I mean, I know yeah. we'll have probably an FA Cup game somewhere in there. But yeah. having the ability to not be thrown into a match as soon as you're back from injury. Very, yeah. very good. Very nice. Time for the revenge mission um, against Chelsea. Or time for them to rule out the five players that came straight back. I thought you were going to say time for the revenge mission against Matt Cash, but I guess we're done with that now. Mm, yeah, I, I don't get this beef with Villa. I, like They're trying to create a rivalry with us. Like I'm, I'm annoyed at Cash, uh, but I just don't, yeah. I don't care yeah. about Aston, like Aston Villa. Just... I a proper I'm, English football club. Yeah, I'm neutral to positive. Yeah, I'm just yeah. They, yeah they're well, like, it when, Go on. The, like it when the they beat of Arsenal. Romero, though, from the sidelines when the, after that. <laughs> yeah, you just wait. Romero for had it, murder it? in his eyes. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. Might need to sit him for that game. Their yeah. fans are way above their station. Yeah, like they are, they've yeah. been they've eh. been good they've been good like a, they used to be a really good club and they've been back for five minutes kind of like looking good for half a season and now they're just like why are Tottenham in the talk of a top six we're bigger than Spurs they haven't won shit and I'm like stop trying to create a rivalry man mm. we've got so many clubs we already have to hate <laughs> yeah I mean to be fair every every club has those fucking weirdos we have those weirdos uh, yeah. so I don't know I think it's, it's I think it's best to not to not like true with like you know yeah I'm, I'm, the word is completely they've lost from my a, head. They've done a very good job, in fairness, of Villa, and they're yeah. good to watch. They've done a good yeah. job. We shouldn't yeah. think all of their supporters are like that, just because there are some weirdos on Twitter that shout things for likes. Mm. Yeah, that's true. We've got uh, a strong army of weirdos on Twitter as well. That um, we do. So uh, <laughs> let's let's end it there, then, boys. But up the Spurs, we'll be back on probably well, the game's on Friday. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to do it tomorrow unless we do the prediction. No, Tuesday. Yeah, Wednesday. Wednesday. We'll do it Wednesday. 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 We'll do it Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. And leave your questions in the comments if you want us to read them out on Wednesday's podcast. And guess what? 82% of our listeners don't subscribe. So can you actually subscribe so we get something out of this, like from YouTube, so we can milk the Google Goose and get some payment from them? Thank you, everyone. Um, Do geese? <laughs> can you get milk from geese? <laughs> no. I'm a milk farmer. I'm a farmer's son. I don't actually know the answer to that. No, of course you can't get milk from geese. Um, it's the golden <laughs> goose I'm getting confused with. The uh, golden. The story. Oh yeah, you can totally goose. milk the golden goose. Yeah. You're right. Oh, yeah. Okay. You it's can only milk golden it's geese. A strong Everyone finish knows to this. the pod. Jim. Well done, mate. <laughs> You can, milk a, you can milk a milk. Anyway, <laughs> up the Spurs. Up the Spurs. <laughs>